春花坠木鼓催，桥楼惊起翻飞，皎月。Hi, I'm Marcus. Welcome to the historical series topic of Art of War, famous battle in ancient China. I believe some of you might already have a basic understanding of the Battle of Changping and its profound influence. However, as the largest annihilation battle in the classic era, there is much to discover and learn from this battle. Therefore, I would like to introduce more about the fantastic strategy, tactics, as well as the cruelty the battle itself presented. Now. Let's get back to nearly 2,400 years ago and salute the legend. The spring and autumn and the Warring States period of China, similar to the Heptarchy and the Sengoku period, was famous for its sacrilegious scheme and chaos. The states never ceased the fighting against each other. The noble and the plebeian all took the consequence of warfare. After hundreds of years of endless conquest and annexation, when it came to the period of warring states, there were almost seven states left. Yet, peace would not present until the final winner triumphed over the rest. However, this period was also an era of valiance, wisdom, and romance. In this era, people had learned to seek joy amidst sorrow. Although war was inescapable, culture and civilization flourished in this period. People wrote poets to express their concern and emotions. The Book of Songs represents that era and its spirit. While Qing Bell and its unique sound was a sign for the era. And its hierarchical social structure. This period is also known as the part of famous Exile Age, when Democritus and Plato were talking about the composition of the world and the philosophy. And the ancient sage of Ganges civilization tries to discover the souls and the afterlife. In the meantime, great thinkers of China created their own culture explosion, contention of hundreds of school thought. There were mainly twelve schools of thought. Except for the most famous Confucianism, they covered fields like law, military, medical science, agriculture, and so on. The most reputed thinker in this period included, but not limited to, Lao Tzu of Taoism, Mo Tzu of Moism, Han Fei Tzu of Legalism, Sun Tzu of Military Strategist, and so on. Their ideologies will determine the future of China. One more thing we need to know is the Warring States period was far more turbulent and chaotic compared with the period of Spring and Autumn. Consequently, the key point of whole society was the struggling of politics and the military. Pragmatism and efficiency was encouraged by the official level, thus to the academic level. 
military strategist and legalism were favored by feudal lords. When entering into the period of the warring state, in order to adapt to the development of society and increase national power, the seven states all experienced reforms to some extent. And what change did Qin and Zhao State make? Did they get stronger after the reform? When Shangyang successfully lobbed the Duke Qin Xiaogong to adopt his ideology of legalism in 364 BC, he was certain Qin State would rise up soon with his reform. What he did not know was his reform would influence China for almost 2,000 years. Now, let's take a look at the abstract of Shangyang's reform, mainly covering four points. First, allowing the trade and the privatization of land. Second, reward military achievement and encouraging farming production. Third, establishing the system of prefecture and counties. Fourth, establishing the guild association system and the forbidden private fight. The nature of Xiangyang's reform is a law of wartime to some extent. It was efficient but oppressive to the people. It was harsh yet fair to all. It mobilized all resources available to serve only one purpose. The Therefore, it has the duality of both progressiveness and the limitation of the era. At the beginning of 3rd century BC, after two generations' effort, when King Qin Zhao Xiangwang took his throne, the Qing state had become the superpower among the seven. No matter in its military strength or national power, Every king of Qing state had only one dream and mission, to unify whole China one day. While the situation was relatively simple in Zhao state, as the border of Zhao state was close to Nomad, in 307 BC, the king decided to carry out the reform, adopting Nomad's clothing and learning their cavalry archery. Since then, Zhao State experienced a rapid growth in military strength, ranked the second among the seven by the year 270 BC. Growth in national power will inspire ambition. Thus, conflict between two states had become more and more frequent. By the year of 269 BC, under the leadership of Great General Zhao Shi, Zhao State defeated Qin in the Battle of Guyu. The impact of victory was significant. After this defeat, Qin State began to treat Zhao as a primary threat. They constantly provoked and made trouble for Zhao State. Zhao Shi's triumph brought him both reputation and higher rank, which indirectly presented an opportunity for his son Zhao Shi Kuo to get on the stage. Soon, both states had a fierce struggle around the area of Huishang. Why in Shangna? What's its strategic value? Let's find out together. Shangdao area was named for its precipitous topography in Chinese. We can learn from the 3D map that Shangdao area is a Golan Heights, right between Qing State and Zhao State. If Zhao State take this area, it could easily attack Qing's Hedong Prefecture and disrupt Qing's unification plan.
On the contrary, if Qin takes Shandong, it could continue to head east and even threat Zhao's capital, Handan. Therefore, for Qin and Zhao State, whoever takes control of Shandong will seize the initiative on the strategic level. The decisive battle between Qin and Zhao was inevitable. Ironically, Shandong area was in the control of the Third State, Han State, the tail ender of the Seven. In 262 BC, Qin started to attack Yewang of Han State. Their intention was obvious: to cut off the connection of England and Shandong area, Han State, so that they may have the opportunity to annex this place. Han State seemed to have no option but to surrender Shandong to Qin. Until one man firmly said no. He could never expect his decision. Eventually, he had a triggered off a bloody storm. As the governor of Shandong, Feng Ding knew quite well of the previous grudge between Qin and Zhao State. He decided to take advantage of this. He sent a message to Zhao State: Shandong is willing to surrender itself to Zhao to fight against Qin. Together, King of Zhao had no confidence in facing Bai Si. Thus, he summoned several royal members to discuss Feng Ding's offer. The unconformity was obvious. One party fully objected the absorption of Shandong, as it believed it is a trap inside a war between Qin and Zhao. On the other hand, the other party agreed it was a trap as well. Nevertheless, they insisted that Shandong was too important for its strategic value for Zhao State. They can't let it go for Qin State. After weighing up the pros and cons, finally the King of Zhao decided to follow his uncle Zhao Sheng's suggestion. Take up Shangdang and San Lianpu, one of the top four generals in Warring States period, who was reputed for his bravery to protect the newly absorbed territory. Who was this doting Bai Qi mentioned by King of Zhao? As one of the top four generals of Warring States period. Bai Qi took command of almost 17 battles in his lifetime and never been defeated. Statistics indicate that there were more than two million soldiers killed in the period of Warring States, while it was estimated that Bai Qi alone took half of the population, approximately one million of them. Thus, he earned the nickname Butcher on the battlefield. In summer 262 BC, the Empire-led army of 200,000 strong marched to Shangdong for incoming warfare. Yet they kept waiting until nearly two years passed. The historical material failed to explain why it took nearly two years for Qin's return to Shangdong. Thus, there is a dispute about what year should be the exact start point of the campaign of Changping. Those claim 262 BC was the beginning. Argue that basically there were no sign military activities against each other before the engagement between Qin and Zhao in the same year. By contrast, those support 260 BC was the beginning suggest Feng Ding's counterplay had disrupted Qin's plan to take Shandong in a notorious way. They found themselves had to have. 
decisive battle against Zhao in advance. They must have fully prepared for it. The silence of two years was the accumulation of the strength before strike. The falling movement of Qin may verify the latter point of view. In the spring of 260 BC, the general Wang Ke led an army mopped up half the Shangdang area. The rest of the army and the civilian of Zhao State fled to Changping, the place where Lian Po set up three defense lines. As a great general famous for bravery, at the very beginning, Lian Po tended to confront Qing's force and radical attack. Him. But very soon he changed his mind. In a skirmish in spring 260 BC, the vanguard of Qing's force defeated their counterpart of Zhao State and instantly killed the Empress Vice General Zhao Tian. By realizing the potential gap between Qing and Zhao's force, the Empress decided to take up a defensive position against Qing's attack. He set up mainly three defense lines based on local topography. The first line, defense line of Kongzangli, was set upon the ridge line near Gaobingguan mountain pass. While the second defense line was set up on the right bank, the Danshui River, the third line was set upon the ridge line near Guguan and the Changbingguan mountain pass. Now, let's take a close look of the deployment of three defense lines. The import deployed several fortresses to back up the first defense line. Except for the west and the east of Jiangshan fortresses, he also built Guanglangchen fortress to guarantee supply. Besides, the West Barrier War was set up to further support the defense line of Kong Tanglin here. By taking Xuan Shi City as the main defensive position, the second defense line stretched over the east bank of Danshui River. It had both the support and supply from Han Wang Shan Mountain and Dan Shan Mountain. The third defense line, though far away from the full front, but maintained a supply from the England of Zhao State. Therefore, we can see through the map that Limpo's defense system seems invulnerable based on local topography. Nevertheless, the fact was completely beyond expectation. In June 260 BC, Qing's force assaulted the Gaobingguan mountain pass at a great cost, but all 5,000 defending troops of Zhao were killed. The loss of Gaobingguan mountain pass made two fortresses essentially defenseless. Soon, Qing's force brought them up and annihilated 8,000 troops over there. In July, after transient rest, the Qing's force had taken the rest territory before the second defense line, including the West Barrier War and the Guangwangchen fortress. Yet, on the west bank of Danshui River, in facing the main force of Lian Po on the east bank, General Wang He was at a loss to proceed to the next step. 
The quick fall of the first defense line aroused the interest of historians. That Wei Lianpo's calculated deployment had been penetrated so fast. There is no doubt Qing's military strength plays a significant role in the battlefield. Yet we cannot deny they outnumbered Zhao's force. It was estimated that it was less than fifty thousand soldiers deployed in the first defense line and its neighboring area. But why Lian Po still made such an arrangement, when he already knew the mighty strength of Qin's force? Perhaps once again. Military geography will provide us with some insights. The supply was definitely influenced by topography in Shandong, especially for the number of long-term garrisons. Yet, it is not the key point. As we mentioned previously, in 262 BC, Qin's force took Yuan from Han State to isolate Shandong. As a matter of fact, once they took Yuan, the Taihangxi Mountain Pass nearby will play a critical role in the falling military movement. Due to its unique geographical feature, in ancient times there were four mountain passes entering into this area. Taihangxi Mountain Pass was one of them. The nearest white of Yangchangban Path, the most precipitous path of Taihangxi Mountain Pass, only allow one person to cross. It is of vital military importance. Thus, as long as Qin sent the troops across Taihangxi Mountain Pass, they could outflank and attack Zhang Wenqiu from the rear. This might justify the impulse deployment. Furthermore, some claims that the impulse tactical retreat had depleted numerous effective strength of Qing's force and slowed down their attack by taking advantage of geographical superiority. Anyway, when Qing's flag waving on the top of Hong Kong Ling Qiu, they roughly take the same casualty as Zhao State. They did drive Zhao's force to the east bank of Danshu River, yet they had no chance to outflank the enemy. Now, the pressure come back to Qin's general Wang He, as Zhao's main force set up a stronghold on the other side of Danshu River. Neither Wang He nor Lian Po found it an easy task to break the ice. In a moment, a temporary standoff ended up the noise in the battlefield with the sound of running water. The first part of the introduction of the campaign of Changping is finished here. We shall proceed the second part very soon. Thanks for watching. Please enjoy the rest part of the music if you will. Have a nice day. Chen 为你一点
刀剑三千，热血渐染，塞上秋月天。分明难辨，转身经年聚散皆是缘。天地山河无边，犹记当年。星光浮上眉间，为你一眼。月满银阙，明珠落成霜雪，横路前。上热血无忘，又再重一次心牵。山河剑在手边，笔临阵前，提笔再写恩怨，心事空悬。刀剑三千，热血渐染，再上秋月天。曾经难辨，转身今年聚散，皆是缘。天,天地山河。上眉间，为你难一眼。翻身尘沙，踏破桃花，白衣换铁甲。江湖叱咤，山河真假，单凭一刹那。披剑傲立春夏，凭风策马，又闻春秋冬夏，温酒看落